From the STEM Global Action Studios in New Orleans, this is the Let's Talk STEM with SGA's Dr. Calvin Mackey podcast. STEM Global Action is a national leader in creating STEM-based learning activities and delivering them virtually and in communities around the globe to students grades K through 12. Here's today's moderator, Ken Sane. Hello and welcome to the next episode of Let's Talk STEM with Dr. Calvin Mackey. I'm Ken Sane, your moderator. Today we have another interesting conversation, but before we get started, let's say hello to our host, president, and fearless leader, Dr. Calvin Mackey. Hey, Ken, Dr. Mackey. Thank you, Ken, Ken, Ken. Thank you for having me today. I'm excited. You know, some days I'm excited, but today I'm really <laughs> excited because we have my friend, uh, an innovator, uh, Gerald Solomon from the uh, North American Scholastic Esports uh, Federation, who's going to tell us about gaming and about esports. I know parents, teachers, you hear about this all of the time, but today we're going to get to the to the rooty tooty of it, right? What does this mean? What does it mean for the economy? What does it mean for our children? So I'm very excited, Ken. Let's get very it going. Very good. Very good. Thank you for joining us, Gerald. How are you today? Good. I'm good. Calvin and Ken, great to be here, man. Looking forward to the conversation. Good. So first, uh, just let's just start out. Uh, we'd like to start off with a basic question. Uh, tell us about yourself, uh, your work in STEM, your organization, and how you came to establish NACE. Uh, glad to do that. I kind of have a boring past, really. I spent uh, a little bit of time running a family foundation in Orange County, California, uh, called the Samueli Foundation. Did that for 13 years. Before that, I ran a health foundation in Los Angeles, where we operated and managed the WIC program for LA and Orange County and a variety of public health uh, issues and challenges where basically politicians and public health departments uh, were too uncomfortable dealing with the kinds of public health issues that needed to be dealt with like LGBT issues and needle exchange issues and HIV issues um, that they politicians didn't want to manage. So we did it for them. Um, so I've always been involved in kind of social justice, social service work, trying to really look at the disenfranchised, disengaged, the kids and people who needed it the most. And that's been the core of my work. And then I stumbled on this thing called NACEF, and we'll talk about that. And, you know, as you ask some questions. Very good. Very good. So tell what first question, what, what exactly is esports? Ah, well, you know, that's a good question. A lot of people will give you different answers. It's basically what's referred to as electronic gaming or electronic sports. People know it by titles from things like Roblox and Minecraft, all the way up to Call of Duty, League of Legends, Overwatch. It's a digital version of competition. And what we have done and what makes us so unique in the world is we actually created a STEM-based curriculum where kids can learn skills through gaming and play. So what are some of the unique aspects of your platform? I mean, how do you help kids develop STEM skills? Wow, I could go on for, you know, hours talking about that stuff. Uh, <laughs> basically, basically what we did, and this is when I was in the foundation, and, and I'll give you a little history, uh, if I may, and cut me off if I get a little bit too long-winded on you. Um, when we were doing our work and we were investing in, and, and Calvin knows this well, building out something called the STEM Ecosystems, we were the original funder and I was the founder of that project with Ron Ottinger. And... We were doing good work, but basically we were just reaching, you know, white male, white female, Asian male, Asian female. And we really wanted to have a greater social impact. And I did some research and I came across this thing called gaming and esports, which I knew nothing about. And we decided to go ahead and see if we couldn't figure out a way to bring kids in where they would have fun, kind of like robotics, maker, tinkering, that kind of stuff but more of the digital space that they were enjoying and then build a curriculum around it and show kids how they can learn skills through gaming. And that's what we've done. And I could talk about that as, you know, we move for, you know, further in the conversation. Yeah. Let's but, go to, yeah. Let's go to Dr. Mack. Yeah. But Gerald, you built a curriculum and it's very important for you to talk about the curriculum and the fact that you had the state of California uh, approve the curriculum to be used in the line of standards. Talk about that. So <laughs> you see, here's the deal. I'm, I'm a parent, right? And I see my kids playing all these games and I hear about esports and I'm worried about my kids playing these esports, right? Talk to me as a parent, you know, and an educator, why is this important and why this could be useful in educating my kid? 
Absolutely. First of all, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and there are all facets within it. I'll give you a, just a statistic that will tell you what it's like. Three years ago, at the Overwatch Championships that were done in the Barclays Center in New York, they sold out 19,000 seats in three hours. But that's not really the statistic. The real statistic is more people watched kids play computers against kids on computers in a digital platform called Twitch than the total number of people that year that watched the Super Bowl, that watched the NBA championships, and watched the Major League Baseball championships combined. Imagine what it's like when you have an audience of hundreds of millions of people who just sit there and watch kids play on computers. That tells you the impact of what esports and gaming can be like. And think about it this way, and this is what I tell parents all the time. You may watch kids playing on a computer. Who built the game? Who coded it? Who set up the event? Who created the networking? Who's doing the coaching? Who did the data analytics and used mathematics and statistics to determine how to play better? Who's doing the streaming and shoutcasting, which is play-by-play -play announcement? Who created the fandom art? Who did the logos? Who did the marketing? Who did the biz dev on it? Who created the IT infrastructure? That's all STEM. And that's the future. When you look at Indeed and you look at the job boards that are out there, there are over 10,000 jobs today in that industry alone. And if you can do those kinds of jobs and you have fun at it, then work is not work. Work is something that you get pleasure out of and you can make money at and you can have a good life. And that's ultimately as a parent, what we try to do for our kids, educate them, give them the social skills that they need to develop and thrive, and hopefully have them find a career and an opportunity that they enjoy doing. And that's really what we've done is we connect play and learning. Right. But not only do you connect play and learning, but the kids are getting transferable skills that can transfer to other jobs. You just uh, listed a, you know, a litany of different career paths that could come out of esports and gaming. And I think it's very important for, for parents to hear that because they can understand that these, these kids can take this habit that they have or this, uh, this hobby that they have and, and leapfrog into, into something else. And one thing that you Absolutely. didn't bring up, you know, and parents see it sometime when the kids are playing games and they're talking, right? I mean, some of the kids that are the most, uh, you know, introverted, when they're playing gaming, you really see their personality come out. So there's all different types of, of even uh, social emotional things that's happening when these kids engage, engage across these platforms. Absolutely. One of the things that we were able to do in the foundation is we gave a grant to the University of California that did a four year study. I mean, just to give you a sense of how deep and broad that was, we gave them a million dollars to do a four-year study. They assessed over 3,500 kids, over 1,700 teachers over the period of time to really look at our curriculum, which is around all of those workforce skills we just talked about, through the lens of gaming. And the data was just beyond the charts about how it was taking exactly what you said Kids who were not the baseball player, the basketball player, the football player, you know, the grade A student, the person who is the head of the yearbook, just kids who liked to game and play, who wanted a sense of belonging, who wanted a sense of being valued and affirmed in who they were as individuals. And you put them together in these clubs and they find their purpose and their sense because they're with like-minded people. And, you know, the interesting thing about on you know, esports and online gaming is you don't know if you're male or female. You don't know if you're black or white or brown. You don't know what your gender preference is. You don't even know what country you're in. You come in with these avatars and you represent yourself through this lens and you begin to develop relationships and friends. It gives you a little sense of safety, but it also allows for you to be able to be open and to be vulnerable and to share and to talk and to develop skills just around communication, critical thinking, um, all of the strategic development skills, all the social emotional 21st century skills that we talk about that really are kind of too hard to teach in school. So you, um, 
You know, when you're talking about the, the, the STEM learning ecosystems, and you know, and I want to take privilege to say thank you for founding the STEM learning ecosystem, but also thank you for finding STEM NOLA and making STEM NOLA one of the communities of practice of, of, of the STEM learning ecosystems. And I mean, that that really, when I met you and met the work that you was doing, is like the kids in East Coast, right? I found my tribe. I found mm-hmm. people committed to the work, committed to communities that I was committed to, uh, who was willing to walk side by side with me and help me do the things that we are trying to do. For first and foremost, thank you. But when you was talking about the STEM ecosystem, you said you was reaching a lot of white males and white females and Asian males and females. What is it about esports that have allowed you and your nonprofit to reach out to more uh, minority communities? Kids like to play games. If you were to ask every kid in your program if they play games, I would tell you that over 90% of them will say yes. It may not be competitive and it may not be an Overwatch or a League of Legends, but it may be NBA 2K, it may be Madden, it may be Candy Crush. (laughs) It could be a whole variety of different things. Kids like to play games and it doesn't differentiate or discriminate based upon gender or color. And as I alluded to earlier, when kids get to play and they create an avatar that represents who they are online, it allows for safety, it allows for conversation, it allows for people to have discussion where there's no inbred bias. They don't look at someone and say, this is who you are based upon your color, the zip code you're born in, your gender preference, or whatever it may be. So what happens is it allows for a very inclusive, big tent about people who want to get together and participate and communicate and play. So there's a natural space for people to engage, irrespective of all of those other challenges or topics or issues. So let's talk about uh, the industry. You mentioned it's a multi-billion dollar industry. What are some of the career opportunities and you know what, where, where, where do you see the pathways for parents to make sure that their, their kids get involved in this pipeline? So let me give you uh, an example of a couple of things. Let's take um, Minecraft, which is a game that kids can play. It can go down to elementary school all the way up to high school and beyond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some grown um, folks play Minecraft too now. Let's, oh yeah, our, our biggest partner in Minecraft <laughs> is the U.S. State Department of all things. Yeah, and we have just launched a project that is launching today, actually in two hours, where we created a world in Minecraft called Farmcraft, and we're teaching kids around the world about agriculture, biotechnology. We're teaching them about climate change all of the sustainable developmental goals and issues that we in the world have to face. And in part of it, they're doing it all through play. They go into Minecraft and what they have to do is work as a team. So there's teamwork and communication. What they then have to do is they have to figure out what's the avatar or character they want. So they create that. So there's some technology involved. Then they have to go ahead and go into these various biomes that we have. We've created five of them. There are different climates around the world. They have to buy seeds. They have to plant seeds. They have to water. They have to go ahead and deal with bug infestation. They have to harvest. They have to till the soil and manage the soil with nutrients. They then have to take it to market and they have to sell it. (laughs) And they have to go ahead. So they're learning entrepreneurship. They're learning innovation. They're doing it through experience. You know, there's an old saying, Fail is not to lose, fail is first attempt at learning. That's what we provide these kids, a safe space to experience, to experiment. And they go through this process. And then when they're all done, they have to go ahead and videotape themselves, talk about what they learned around agriculture, climate change, biotechnology, coding their program. And they have to videotape themselves, post it up on Flipgrid to then be judged. The amount of skill and the amount of technology and STEM skills that they're learning are huge. And to them, they're not learning anything. They're just playing a game. They're trying to figure out, how am I going to win this game? How am I going to get the best seeds, the most seeds, and make the biggest difference, and then be the shining star you know, that wins the prize at the end of the game? And those skills transfer into so many different things. You, know, you talk about industry and STEM and STEM skills. I'll just give you, especially around 
CTE tracks. Too often we talk about, oh, my kids got to go to college. Uh, Career tech. So career tech. So those are the tracks that every state has. And there's a whole set of criteria around what it means to have career tech uh, credentialing so that for the family that may not or the student that may not want to or afford a four-year institution, you can get incredible skills in credentialing and have a great career in so many different ways in graphic design and event management. Can you imagine if you put on a tournament in esports and you had a hundred, sometimes a thousand, we have tournaments where we have 10, 20, 30,000 kids who are playing at a time in playoffs. The person who puts on that event, that's a huge amount of work. There's a whole career tech track on what's called hospitality and event management. If you can do that in esports, you can work for Marriott, you can work for Hilton, you can work for Hyatt, you can work for Boeing, you can work for Intel, you can even work maybe for STEM NOLA and put on an event and be able to do something that the community needs, people want, people learn, people grow, so that skills are incredibly transferable across industry disciplines. Hey, but, but talk about this, right? Because my sons, they played in their games and they came home one day and one of the kids at this school didn't even win the tournament, but it was a, na- a national tournament. And they pulled this kid up online, the kid had won a million dollars, but a kid at this school had won like 50,000 because he, he, he ranked someplace in the competition. So kids out there really making money even before they leave home for college uh, in, the gaming, in the gaming industry. Yeah, it's pretty wild to see. I mean, you've got entities from, you know, Coca-Cola to 7-Eleven to everyone who's wanting to provide sponsorships. Um, For them, you know, it's about branding and branding identification. But for the child, for the kid, it's about, wow, I can take something that I really love and I enjoy. And you mean, I can make money at it. I can then maybe make a career out of it and see where it goes. We know in sports, I mean, look at football, baseball, whatever it is, you know, maybe you have a seven, 10 year lifespan in a career. In esports, your career is infinitely smaller. By the time you're 18 to 20 years old, you're done because your dexterity, your reflexology, all of that, you can't compete with the teenager. They're just too quick, too fast, too capable. So by the time you're in your 20s, you're pretty much a has been in many ways in esports. So what do you do with that child who made 50 grand, who has these grandiose ideas that says, you know, I'm going to be the Michael Jordan of esports. In most cases, it will never happen. So how do you take that passion and that interest and put it into a pathway where you can say to that kid, well, you know what, what else do you like? Do you like art? Do you like graphic design? Do you like event management? Do you like coding? Do you like to be a coach? Are you good in math? Do you want to go at the end of the game and download all the data and use statistics and analyze the data so your team can play better? All of those kinds of skills could be developed through esports and gaming. And that's what we do is we let the kids play, we let them enjoy, and then we start having conversation with them about, so what do you like about it? What was good? If you had an opportunity to pursue something around it, what would be the things that would be interesting? You know, how about the kid who loves to talk, who just loves to be the center of attention? You know, in sports, that's the announcer. You know, that's the play-by-play. In esports, it's called shoutcasting. If you can shoutcast, hey, you know, you could be the next Howard Cosell. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about the barrier to entry, right? Because we had a conversation here in New Orleans, and I was trying to convince the city council why it was important for them to pass the 5G bill. Uh, and when we start talking about the lack of broadband in certain communities, these are the type of things that communities, especially low resource, resource, low income, low resource communities don't have access to because they don't have the pipes to otherwise get it there. Can you speak on that? Absolutely. There are a lot of ways in which you can handle it. First, you're doing exactly right. You got to put pressure on government officials to allocate funds accordingly. And you got to make that happen. But let's assume you're in a place that's just a tech desert, you know, just like a food desert, but with technology, you know, missing. Um, What can you do? Well, one of the things that you can do 
is you can play it mobily because most kids have mobile phones yes. and smartphones. So you can play a lot of these games. You can play the games on all types of computer systems, uh, even Chromebooks on many of the games. And let's assume for a minute, none of that's working. You can't do any of that for whatever reason. You don't have internet connection, et cetera. You can go to your library. You can go to your Boys and Girls Club. You can go to your YMCA. You can go to the computer lab in the school because all of those spaces generally have some type of technology capacity. And part of what we don't do well is we don't connect the dots amongst all the various providers. How can the Boys and Girls Club and Y and Library be a true partner in education and learning? Here's a great example. How do you partner? How do you collaborate? How do you work together? Interestingly enough, in our program, because we form clubs and schools, out of approximately three and a half to four hours of what we call scholastic esports work, kids only play in our program 23 minutes a week. It's not about the play because when we set up the clubs, and this is what really attracts kids, is we're not just about the com competitor and the title play. We set up all of these various committees like who's going to be in charge of streaming? Who's going to be in charge of fandom art? Who's going to be in charge of graphic design? Who's going to build the marketing plan? Who's going to build our website? How are we going to create merchandise and sell merchandise so we can make money to buy peripherals and better computers and faster computers and all the things that we need? Who's going to go ahead and provide all of the other infrastructure and support that we need to move forward? Everyone takes a role. How about health and wellness? Let's just talk about that for a second, if I can, Calvin. Yep. You know, one of the things that people have a misconception of is that these are kids who stay up at night and eat Cheetos and drink Red Bull at 11 o'clock at night, you know? I mean, it's just like this, these game addicts. But look at the people like the Tom Brady's and, you know, the people who are really skilled, the discipline they have. Do you know that the best esport teams now have exercise physiologists, they have psychologists, they have health coaches. And if you were to talk to them, they are getting eight hours of sleep. They're doing yoga and MBSR, mind, body, stress, relaxation before games because it focuses them into better play. They're eating well, they're sleeping better, they're engaging better. They're doing the kinds of things, not because we as a parent or a school say, you need to drink 64 glasses, you know, ounces of water a day, or you need to eat X number of you know, fruits and vegetables. They do it because they enjoy the game and they want to be better at the game. So their motive is, hey, I'm doing what I like. I want to be good at it. And by the way, there are some health benefits to it. So we don't drill and kill around traditional education, do this, do this, do this, and learn how to do it. We say, do you want to play better? Well, you know what? You weren't focused as much as you could have been. How can you focus better? Well, help me focus better so I could play better. Well, you know, if you take five minutes before you play and you do a little bit of mind body yoga exercise work and you clear your mind and you focus on the game, you've reduced your cortisol level, you've reduced your blood pressure, you've increased your acuity and capacity to play and engage in the game. You're now healthier and better because of your interest in gaming. Those are the kinds of things that we do and we teach. Well, Gerald, I'm gonna turn in my Peloton and become a gamer. You convinced <laughs> me that that's what I need to be doing. I need to be <laughs> gaming. But you know, you talked about access and access is very important to me. It's very important to STEM NOLA. And two things that we're doing, you know, we're building a 42,000 square foot STEM innovation hub. And I've already decided that we're gonna have a dedicated uh, esports uh, space in there. So kids can come after school on Saturdays and practice or, and or compete. And we also, we have a 40 foot RV that we're renovating. And I want to, I want to just renovate it to have 10 esports stations on there where we can go in and out of communities that otherwise may not have, you know, the access in rural areas or low income uh, areas and, you know, in urban areas and let kids, you know, really experience that arena feeling, right. Where they can be amongst other kids and, and have all the technology that they need. So esports is definitely on our radar and esports is definitely something that all kids can do. I play basketball in school. 12 guys make the basketball team. And usually, you know, you have 12 guys on the basketball team. 
One may make it in college, but we really didn't learn a lot of skills in basketball that otherwise was transferable besides talking trash and leadership, mm-hmm. maybe. But yep. esports provide all kids the opportunity to de- develop all of those 21st century skills that our kids will desperately need for the work of the future. And that's what we got to hammer to the parents. We're talking about jobs and work of the future, not of the 20th century. The things that they're getting from esports will prepare them uh, for the jobs of the 21st century. And, and you know, it's it's about empowering kids. It's about giving them the opportunity to thrive and grow and learn in what they do. When you put these kids together and you play a basketball game, they figure out how to play. It's the same thing in esports. Who's going to be the shotcaster? Who's going to be the streamer? Who's going to go ahead and put the event together? Who's going to create the website? Who's going to go ahead and go out and do some biz dev and raise some money so we can get jerseys and we look cool, you know, with our logo that someone in our club created for ourselves. That's what it's about. It's about building the team. It's about building culture. It's about building skills without them thinking that they're building and doing that. And it's great. I mean, you know, I'll I'll give you one thing that you can think about as you build this out for yourself and for STEM NOLA, really all you're doing is you're building a computer lab and you're building a maker space and you're building a tinkering space and you're building a space for all these immersive experiential activities. That's really what esports and gaming is about. It's just another tool in that toolkit so that the kid who doesn't want to do robotics or can't afford it, or the kid that doesn't want to do maker or science fairs for whatever reason, they like the game, they like to play. Well, here's a pathway for them. You've got to figure out one, how to meet kids where they are, how to speak their language, and how to give them something that's fun and meaningful for them that has relevance to them. Because if it doesn't, they'll walk away and they won't participate. Hey, Ken. I'm starting an eSport league for old men, man. Are you down with me? I'm with you all the way. All the way. I don't know what position I'm going to play, but count me in. As, like Gerald What's said, some of, I think some of my dexterity is gone, but I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Don't worry about it. There it is. I'll work the volume knob. How's that? <laughs> You could do what you do. You facilitate, you talk, you're the, you know, you're the GM, you go ahead and you become the shopcaster in what they do. And there's a big business of being able to do that play by play. And I want to add, you know, I want to add uh, some people, some people don't know this, but I mean, there are now professional teams. Yeah. That's uh, what I wanted to talk professional about. Professional like, teams in yeah. cities. They're, they're building arenas. They're building this gigantic esport arena. Cox Communications just bought a big building downtown Atlanta, and it's going to be an mm-hmm. esport arena. So just like you have the Superdome where the Saints play, they're now building arenas where these professional teams play. And they have teams all over the world, uh, professional teams that that, that kids and, and, and people follow online and buy their merchandise. So just like the kids are doing it in the communities, in the clubs that you sponsor, Gerald, there, there really is a professional league, parents and educators, uh, that that participate across the globe. There are pathways that. to those leagues everywhere. You know, there's Envy in Texas. There's Ghost in Atlanta. There's the Immortals um, in California and in the Great Lakes. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of teams. In each one of those teams, just like a basketball team or a baseball or a football team, they have the players. But surrounding the players are the infrastructure the coaches, the GMs, the people who put it together, the people that do, and I'm, I'm a broken record, but you know, people who do the data analytics, people who create the website, people who sell sponsorships, you know, people who do all of these other activities, those are skills and those are good paying skills. And, and, and parents, colleges are now offering, you think they're offering football scholarships and basketball scholarships and academic scholarships. Colleges are now offering esports scholarships. Yes, your kid who's down there playing the game, which you're upset about, can actually get a, a scholarship to college to play on the esport team for universities now, right, Gerald? Last year, the colleges in the United States gave away $18 million in scholarships. And that's just the beginning because more and more, they are attracting kids to come in who play. And just like in football or baseball or basketball, there's followings now, and that brings in attendance, that brings in dollars, that brings in opportunity for colleges and universities. So esports is becoming 
the tip of the spirit in many ways for our schools to be able to compete, raise their credibility and bring in top notch students. You know, I will say this, and this is something we haven't touched on. If you play esports with us, you need to have strong academic skills or you can't play. We have thresholds. You can't have any disciplinary action against you. You need to have at least a 2.0. And if you get into playoffs, you need to at least have a 2.5. And some schools that require a 3.0 grade point average in order to compete and play, just like you would expect. You have to keep your academics up. You got to be a good citizen. You got to play well with others in order to be able to compete in esports competition. Great. Take us home, Ken. Very good. Thank you so much, Gerald, for your time. We appreciate it all. We, you know where we are. We hope you'll come back. I'm going to come down and play you in a little bit of Rocket League or League of Legends again. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. <laughs> Brad, Brad, Gerald, be, be my pleasure. Look forward to it. Brad, Gerald, I want to say thank you. Thank you for, you know, we're talking about esports, but we can go on a whole nother hour talking about what Gerald has accomplished and what he means to the entire STEM uh, ecosystem, a STEM community across this country. Uh, thank you for your, your commitment to STEM, but also thank you to commitment to all kids uh, for STEM for all to make sure there's ac access for everybody. Since the day I met you, that has been, you know, the, the, the theme that you, you carry yourself with and I appreciate it. And, and I just thank you for your friendship and uh, the ability for us to work and uh, make a difference together. Well, it's my pleasure. And We'll always do that with you, Calvin. Look forward. Well, thank you all for joining us for this latest episode of Let's Talk STEM. We appreciate you being here. We we'll hope you'll join us next time and continue to follow us on all our social media platforms. Thank you and goodbye. You've been listening to a STEM Global Action Podcast. Through our STEM-based programming, we put students on a path towards quality jobs in science, technology, engineering, and math. Visit us at www.stemglobalaction.com. Until next time, let's keep talking STEM.